And there will basically be um, uh, three sections. One that has to do with describing how we use neutrons to probe structure of materials. Um, so some sort of uh, um, atomic scale to mesoscopic scale structure of magnetic and uh, just the chemical structure. We can also probe that using neutron scattering. Um, in the second part of this lecture, we will talk about um, how we use neutrons to probe excitations in condensed matter. And in the third part, having sort of been introduced to the methods uh, and some of the theoretical background, uh, we'll talk about what the instrumentation actually looks like. So there will be kind of pictures from, uh, from the lab, and some of it is, is quite unfamiliar typically. Uh, you know, how do you actually do this stuff, and, and where do you get the neutrons from, and how do you detect them, and all this kind of stuff we'll do in the third part of this lecture. And so then with that uh, under our belts, uh, tomorrow at the same time, uh, we're going to talk about using this technique to do what I'd call quantum statistical physics of materials. Um, so these will be, that, that seems like a pretty broad topic, but what, the way we're going to limit it is we're going to talk about um, insulating materials, so things where charge doesn't move around and where the magnetism arises from atoms, be they rare earth or transition metal atoms, uh, which are uh, so kind of dipole moments that sit in place. Uh, but then learning with neutron scattering how they interact and how they create uh, collective, interesting collective phenomena. Um, and some of the topics will be chosen for illustrative purposes and some of it to, uh, to tell you what's going on, kind of the frontier of this kind of work. Uh, so that was insulated, the, kind of the quantum magnetism of insulating materials is tomorrow. And then on Friday, we're going to, oh sorry, on, on Thursday, the third lecture, we're going to talk about uh, the, um, the uh, uh, magnetic properties of uh, strongly correlated uh, materials, and these will involve uh, materials where the spin degrees of freedom are actually moving around, so you've got electrons in the band structure which have magnetic properties, and we're going to probe that using neutrons. So in that context, neutrons become a really uh, interesting tool for getting at um, uh, correlations between electrons in, uh, in metals, or it could be in uh, in materials that are right at the boundary between metal and insulator or perhaps between insulator and superconductor. So that's the kind of lay of the land and in all of this I really welcome your questions and um, um, just interrupt me, we don't have to go through it all and I'll post these slides at the end of it so you can take a look um, uh, at it in, in the uh, quiet of your dorm room and uh, especially there may be some a lot of formulas on some of the slides and we'll kind of selectively go through some of it and you can look at some of it later as well. Um, okay, good. So I've been doing this for quite a while. In fact, I would claim that I probably started this, uh, I don't know if this is good or bad, but I started this probably before you were born, many of you. So it, as a high school student, actually, I sort of got involved for some reason or another because there was a nuclear reactor in the town I was growing up. And um, so this is what happens. <laughs> anyway, no. Uh, you know, uh, somehow there was a good place to have a summer job and things like that, so I got started in, in the 80s, uh, actually, no, some in the 70s. So anyway, so um, uh, then over the years I worked with a lot of people and I just want to list some of them up here. Um, uh, you, can, you can look at them later and they can look at it later, but uh, it's been really important to collaborate with um, many different students and postdocs and faculty and it's also been very important to have uh, facilities where you can actually do this, uh, these kinds of experiments. Um, and I'll show you pictures from these places later. And I've, I've worked at other facilities than these, but in recent years, uh, the experiments are typically done in Maryland. We have a research reactor there at NIST. Uh, and there's another facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, the spallation neutron source is there, as well as a 80 megawatt reactor. And sometimes we travel around to other places. This is uh, the ISIS facility, uh, which is in the, uh, in the UK. Good. So that, that is the overview, which I think I, I kind of told you about uh, what we're going to do there. A uh, little bit of the fundamentals, something about structure, something about it, uh, excitations, and then we'll, we'll talk about what the instruments actually, um, actually look like. Good. Now, um, apart from my slides, uh, there are, of course, many, many other resources on, uh, on to, for you to learn about uh, neutron scattering. And uh, you may not want to... You know, maybe you don't need to look at all these books right now, but it's nice to know that there are such books if you at some point need to really dive more into it for your own work or to understand others' work, the work of others. 
Um, and let me just say that there's there are various courses um, that have uh, taken place, and and here's one I. I'm going to try to update this link. I think this link is not the right one right now, but uh, you can actually access a whole series of lectures, uh, if, if this is not enough, on nutrient scattering, all aspects of it uh, in gory detail. Uh, and I'll try to get you the right link for that. And in terms of uh, monographs on nutrient scattering, um, here are a couple. These are kind of the classical works. And, and personally, I really like this uh, uh, quite thin book written by Gordon Squires. Uh, uh, quite a few years back, but it basically has all the, uh, the, the right uh, kind of content. And then if you really need the full detail in this, this is a two book uh, series that, that has a lot of, um, uh, it kind of goes into the more detail that you typically use in actual, that you use in actual experiments. And then these are actually kind of more modern books that have uh, more details about instrumentation. And this book, I think, has some details about uh, magnetic group theory and things like that. Um, so lots of good books for you to look at. All right, but it's all going to revolve ar around the use of the neutron to probe condensed matter. And uh, there are a couple of features that are important. Probably most of these you, uh, you're well aware of. It's a, it is a spin half uh, fermionic particle. And so it has a magnetic dipole moment. And so it becomes a really wonderful probe of uh, magnetism at the atomic scale. Um, also important is the fact that it has uh, a mass. And the actual number is is in, in fact uh, important in a kind of uh, instrumentation or measurement. Uh, uh, you know, all, of, all of the features of the way we do our measurements are very much uh, influenced by the actual value of the mass. And it turns out that the neutron has such a mass that uh, when its uh, de Broglie wavelength is on order the um, lattice spacing in a material, then its kinetic energy is of order thermal energy. So that's really a wonderful situation to be in. It means that you can uh, basically probe both spatial and temporal correlations uh, by the interaction of neutrons with materials. It, it has just the right mass to be able to do that. In contrast, if you think about x-rays, uh, once you have x-rays at uh, angstrom length scales, then the energies are in the kilo electron volt range, which are much beyond kind of relevant energy scales for uh, condensed matter systems. That doesn't hold people back from using a lot of tricks and, and being able to actually use x-rays as well to probe uh, correlated, um, uh, correlated dynamics of condensed matter. Uh, what I would say is that the neutron kind of is born with those properties, that you simply, it's really quite straightforward uh, to be able to, um, uh, to uh, carry out these kinds of experiments, as I'll show you um, a little later when we look at the instrumentation. So that's because the mass comes out exactly right. Now, the, the lifetime is about 15 minutes, uh, so that sounds a little weird. And of course, within the nucleus, um, the nucleus can be stable for, uh, you know, for, for a very long periods of time. But once you liberate the neutron and it's a free particle, it decays uh, into a proton, electron, and a neutrino. Um, and so it means that you need to finish your experiment in 15 minutes, which is not a problem at all, because most of our measurements, are, uh, they, they take longer, but we use the individual neutron for just uh, seconds or, or much less than that, maybe milliseconds. Uh, but it does mean that you can't kind of store your free electrons. You have to make them uh, and then use them right away. Um, so this will have an impact on the kind of sources that we will work on. OK, good. So that's the, the neutron and its properties. And then comes the question of what is it that we're actually measuring? Um, and the good news is that it's actually very, very straightforward in a sense that's, that all of the neutron experiments that you will see, um, that, you know, mostly uh, that those I will talk about and those that you'll hear others talk about essentially are a measurement of a scattering cross-section. So if you figure out what is meant by a scattering cross-section, then you're already in pretty good shape. Uh, if the person is not really relating uh, the work to a scattering cross-section, it's probably because they've kind of removed it quite a bit from the actual measurement. The actual measurement is that of a scattering cross-section. Um, all right, so let me just introduce what a scattering cross-section is. Um, so here we have uh, uh, indication of a, the wave vector associated with a uh, monochromatic neutron beam. And here's a little cross-section. And I first have to introduce uh, what I mean by the flux um, the, the flux of neutrons, and that would be the rate of neutrons passing through a given cross-sectional area divided by the, uh, that area. Um, 
And of course, I have to do this in, in a differential fashion so I can talk about the flux at a given location. Uh, so the dimensions of this are going to be uh, neutrons per area unit per time unit. And typically, we talk about neutrons per square centimeter per second. And here's an important number, actually, for the experimental work, which is uh, the kinds of fluxes that we can achieve, monochromatic fluxes, in an actual experiment range uh, typically from 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 9th neutrons per square centimeter per second. Now that's actually a quite low flux if you compare to any kind of x-ray measurements or the flux in this, uh, in this laser. You know, these are really, really small numbers. In fact, um, if you look at the, the total flux of neutrons generated by, a, I think it's a one megawatt reactor, it sort of corresponds to more or less a, the amount of photons coming from a candle. So it's, it's a really, unfortunately, a relatively low flux facility that we typically are working with. Um, but we accept it and we figure out how to work with these low fluxes because the information is very specific and very useful. Um, all right, so that's the flux. And then let me kind of progress in the direction of being more and more specific in what it is we, uh, we measure. Um, so the, the first and kind of the coarsest way that you could consider a neutron experiment would be to, just to measure the rate of scattering overall. Uh, right, so I wouldn't figure out the direction of scattering and I'm not keeping track of the energy of the scattered neutrons, just saying what is the rate of scattering. That's a very, very coarse thing. It still holds some information. Now let's just look at how we would measure that. Well, we would, we would simply measure what's the rate of neutrons being scattered divided by what is the, um, what is the flux incident on the material. Um, so this would be, this is what we call a, a, a macroscopic scattering cross, cross section. And it would have dimension of an area because this one has uh, area in the denominator. So all of this thing is like an area. So a cross section for scattering has dimension of an area. And if you just think about the case of a single atom, uh, it turns out that the cross-section resulting from uh, the influence of the strong nuclear force in its interaction between the neutron and the nucleus of the atom, that's going to be something in the range of 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared. And we call that unit one barn because it sort of is the scale of things that we would typically be looking at. And you can maybe associate that with some sort of effective surface area of the nucleus. That's, in a sense, what, this, uh, what we would be measuring if we just measure the overall scattering from the, uh, from the object. But then we can become more specific, and we can look at a differential scattering cross-section, which is uh, what is the rate of neutrons scattered into a specific solid angle, d omega. This is going to give us more information about the object that we are scattering from. And the dimension of this is going to be um, it's going to be, uh, let's see, uh, it's an area per uh, steradian. That's a partial differential cross-section. Um, and we're going to look at experiments that specifically measure this partial differential cross-section. Uh, I could also become even more specific, and I can say, let me look at the rate of neutrons uh, entering my detector, uh, but only those which are within some specific range of energies around some chosen final energy. Then I'm talking about a partial differential cross-section, and it's going to have units of area per steradian per, uh, per energy unit. Uh, and so for inelastic scattering experiments, it will be this feature that we typically will be uh, looking at. Any questions thus far? Yes? Uh, so, uh, I remember why is the total interior cross-section in area? It seems like it should be like unitless or something, or like a number, number of neutrons scattered. Uh, this thing? Well, it's because uh, I want to measure it in terms of the, of the flux of the incident beam. And the flux has an area in it because it's, it's a, uh, it is a um, neutrons per area unit that will come in there. So because of that, it ends up being area. Yes? Is there a lens before the circle? A lens? OK, so uh, yeah, there are all sorts of gadgetry that we do before and after the sample to focus the beam and, and to select the energy of the beam and things like that. And uh, th this we'll talk about a little later. But the concept that I have in this sketch is that we somehow are able to obtain a monochromatic uh, beam of neutrons that has a specific direction associated with it. So in a sense, the, the concept is that I know a lot about the incident beam because I prepare it in a certain fashion. And then I'm going to map out the, uh, the pattern of scattering when it interacts with my unknown sample. And then I somehow I'm going to 
uh, use this information, which is going to be a function of momentum and energy, to infer information about structure and dynamic in the material. Yes? So the low flux means that uh, you need larger sample sizes? Uh, that's correct. Um, so is there a minimum sample size beyond which you cannot measure anything meaningful? I would say, yeah. I was, Huh? Yeah, you can just keep going. No, there, there's definitely a, a limits. Uh, there definitely are limits, but those are constantly evolving, actually, over time. So, um, what I'd say is that uh, the ones of us who've been doing it for a while, we, we respect the kind of information that can come out. And so, if someone comes along to us and says, I have this sample, it's really interesting. I really would like to know something about the um, uh, spin excitations in this material, but I can only give you 80 milligram. That's all I can do. Then we'll give it a shot, and uh, we usually can be successful with those quantities, um, uh, even in inelastic scattering. Now, if we talk about um, probing structure of materials, then we can go down to maybe, maybe uh, 10 milligram, maybe even 1 milligram in some cases, uh, but it becomes now harder and harder. And uh, So it tends to be very important to balance the effort that goes into um, making the quantity and the quality of the material you're going to study and then the time that you're going to spend at the source. Uh, it's expensive to keep the source running. Um, so um, so that's, that's sort of the... I'd say that that's not really a hard and fast lower limit. I would say that we work with materials all the way from a milligram to, uh, to uh, 50 gram. If you can give us 50 gram, we're happy and we'll, we'll proceed. Yes? How do you guide those Guide? Okay, so that, that I will basically by refraction. So, um, and we'll get to it a little later. So, but the, the basic concept is that once you've um, created a beam of neutrons, they're, uh, you know, they're subject to the force of gravity, but, but they're, they end up um, moving in such a way that almost, um, almost like a free gas, non-interacting gas. But the, what you can do is you can, ref you can use refractive uh, optics to, to actually focus the neutrons. And we'll talk a bit about, uh, about that concept as well. Okay, all right, so um, <clears throat> ways that neutrons interact with materials, uh, there are basically two ways, the strong nuclear force, um, which gives rise to a, uh, a, um, a cross-section, oh sorry, to an interaction potential that is very localized in space, has a characteristic length scale of 10 to the minus 15 meters, so femtometers typically. And so that will actually give rise to a um, almost momentum-independent uh, cross-section. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, the, the character of that in a little. I just want to talk about this, the scale of it. Um, so the overall uh, scattering cross-section that we would associate with this interaction potential uh, is 4 pi times, times this constant squared. This is the scattering length. And this ends up being approximately one barn. You remember that was the unit I told you about, 10 to the minus 24. Uh, centimeter squared, and this cross section actually varies quite erratically, if you will, across the uh, periodic table. And if you'd like to do all the nuclear physics and so on, you can probably, you can actually, uh, you may have an interest in knowing what the sizes of these cross sections are. Uh, but for us, these are kind of givens uh, that we use to our benefit as we go through the, uh, the periodic table. And so the, the advantage, in a sense, compared to x-rays, where with x-rays, uh, the Thomson cross-section rises with a z squared for the atom. So if I have lead and I have uh, carbon, for example, in the same structure, then I'm in, with x-rays, completely dominated by lead. With neutrons, it turns out that uh, carbon has a big scattering cross-section and lead does not have such a big cross-section. So those, I have, I have uh, the ability to see both of those at the same time. So I can see, let's say, light atoms within a heavy matrix, and that becomes a benefit uh, for structural work uh, with, uh, with neutrons. Um, okay, the other thing I want to point out is that there is an electromagnetic interaction just of the magnetic dipole moment of the neutron uh, with the uh, internal uh, position-dependent field uh, configuration in the material. So if I have electrons in there which are uh, creating some sort of order of magnetic structure, I will have a spatially varying magnetic field distribution, and this will give rise to um, uh, a complicated magnetic interaction uh, potential, uh, which will then give rise to scattering. 
Uh, so that's the other means that I interact with materials. And it turns out that that uh, cross-section, uh, the unit for that is the classic, electro classical electron radius squared. And that turns out to be uh, sort of a third of a barn. That's an interesting 